I've been an adult for a while now, and in recent years, I find myself wondering why things are the way they are. And more specifically, were they always like this? You see, I'm a voter, and as any voter can tell you, politics are complicated. So complicated that most people don't even bother. I certainly haven't been immune to that fact. It's only in recent years that I've made an effort to understand certain policies and programs, which is way more difficult than you might think. And I'm forced to ask, why? Well, if you want to better understand the state of American politics, I would recommend that you look at the prevailing philosophical trends within America. And to better understand the connection between the philosophical trends within a culture and the politics of that culture, I would recommend checking out a book called The Ominous Parallels, which was authored by objectivist philosopher Leonard Peikoff. Today, we are going to look at the YouTube channel Knowing Better, which, as you can see, pretty big channel, over 600,000 subscribers on YouTube. You may also notice that I am subscribed to this YouTube channel. I used to enjoy Knowing Better's videos, but lately, people have been hitting me up on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, even my Facebook fan page, asking me to uh, take a look at this video and respond. As you can see, the video is titled Redefining American Capitalism, Libertarianism. Already has over 200,000 views. This is not the first video of his that disappointed me. He made a video a few months back about oil, which I thought uh, had a lot of flaws in it, but uh, I let that one slide. But uh, uh, apparently I need to take a look at this video. So uh, let's check it out in a previously hidden valley. A completely original story that I'm By the way, he's talking about uh, the philosopher. You may have heard me mention her before. Her name is Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand. This video is uh, heavily focused on Ayn Rand, even though she does not appear in the title. I'm sure will never be plagiarized. In 1921, Lenin and the Bolsheviks enacted a new economic policy, which confiscated and nationalized her father's pharmacy. This theft by the government became a rather formative experience. Theft by the government, so uh, he, he already admits that Lenin and the Bolsheviks, they took over Russia, where Ayn Rand lived. She grew up in the Soviet Union. And uh, they took her father's, they took her family's business. He calls it theft. Keep this in mind, folks. That same year, the Bolsheviks opened up universities to women for the first time, allowing her to attend Petrograd State University, where she majored in history and graduated in 1924. Then she studied screenwriting at the State Institute for Cinematography. That was also the same year Stalin came to power. The State Institute for Cinematography. That might that might come up, uh, that, that might sound familiar soon for cinematography. That was also the same year Stalin came to power and many people, especially of Jewish heritage, were looking for reasons to leave. So S Joseph Stalin, the man of steel, Joseph Stalin came to power and suddenly many people, particularly those of Jewish ancestry like Ayn Rand, they were looking for reasons to leave. Gee, I wonder why. Again, keep this in mind, folks. Alyssa Rosenbaum was granted a visa to visit relatives in the United States in 1925. She left her parents behind and arrived in New York in 1926. Upon seeing the Manhattan skyline, she decided she wanted to live here forever. There was a I think she decided that before visiting Manhattan. Might be wrong, though. The problem with that dream, though. The Johnson-Reed Act prevented most immigrants from getting jobs, especially Jewish immigrants. So she changed her name to Ayn Rand and moved to Hollywood to work as a screenwriter. Now, I'm no expert on the life and biography of Ayn Rand, but I know Yaron Brook, I think he mentioned a few weeks ago, that uh, the main reason Ayn Rand changed her name after coming to America was because, uh, well, some of you guys might not know this, but uh, communist regimes are um, not too fond of criticism and free speech. And so uh, knowing that she would be coming to America and being very critical of communism and the Soviet Union, uh, she decided to change her name to uh, protect her family who was still in the Soviet Union. And uh, as we know, communist regimes, dictatorships of all sizes and colors, um, they have a history of punishing uh, families of critics if they, uh, if they are not able to uh, punish the critic themselves. 
scriptwriter in the film industry. While working on the set of The King of Kings, she met Frank O'Connor, and the two were married in 1929. When she first moved to Hollywood, most movies were silent films, and as they began to transition to talkies, her broken English became more and more of an issue. So she shifted her focus to writing novels and political activism. This was during the Great Depression and FDR's New Deal, which reinvigorated the economy through public works projects and welfare programs like- Really? Reinvigorated the economy? Oh, really? Is that what happened under FDR? He just waltzed on in during the Great Depression and through his brilliant economic planning, he uh, he brought the American economy back into his prosperity. Is that what happened? No, 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 of course not. No, according to uh, the book, Great Myths of the Great Depression and other sources, um, five years into FDR's presidency, into his second term, there was another stock market crash that uh, caused unemployment, which was already high. It was, you know, going down a little bit, but it was already high. In uh, 1935, it was at 18% by 19... In, um, it was lower than 14% by 1937. But after the uh, market crash, it went back up to 20%. And the market crash of 1937 erased whatever little gains were made during FDR's presidency, which were largely a result of the Supreme Court throwing out some of his g -g 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 garbage economic policies like the National Recovery Act in 1935. So uh, this uh, notion that FDR reinvigorated the American economy, it's, it's a myth, folks. Like Social Security. Rand viewed this. It's also worth noting that uh, Ayn Rand... Uh, actually voted and supported FDR in 1932, from what I know, um, largely because Herbert Hoover was a total failure, but also I think it was because FDR campaigned on making alcohol legal again, which, uh, you know, prohibition was a huge violation of individual rights. Says the first now Ayn Rand considered the New Deal what? What's he about to say? Step towards a totalitarian communist regime. One of her first... Now, this is somewhat true. I think Ayn Rand considers the establishment of antitrust laws as the first turning point away from American capitalism. And I know a lot of objectivist intellectuals and other free market advocates uh, point to the progressive era in general as the first turning point away from free markets in America. Because not only did presidents like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, not only did they really embrace using antitrust to uh, bust up some trusts and take on the greedy monopolies. But they also established the Federal Reserve. The Progressive Era also established the income tax. Um, we also got the FDA. The welfare state was being established. Although the uh, New Deal programs under FDR was another major turning point. So it's not entirely off, but it's worth noting books, Anthem, written in 1937, imagines a future collectivist dystopia where the concept of the individual has been abolished. Even the word I has been erased from the dictionary. All of the characters use neutral or plural pronouns like they and we. In 1943... Uh, I mean, is it that ridiculous to uh, imagine, considering now that we live in a time where a lot of people are uh, rather too obsessed with pronouns? She wrote The Fountainhead, which also explores the conflict between individualism and conformity. This was Ayn Rand's first real success as a novelist, though the book had pretty disappointing sales at first, which sent Rand into a deep depression, which probably wasn't helped by her addiction to Benzedrine, on top of her rampant chain smoking. Sales finally took off after a film adaptation. Yeah, chain smoker, oh. was made in 1949, starring Gary Cooper. He was a pretty big deal, basically the Tom Cruise of his time. It follows an architect named Howard Rourke, who designs buildings in a modern style, while everyone else insists on using a classical Greek style. They even alter his buildings to conform with that standard. Now there's a touch of the new and a touch of the old, so it's sure to please everybody. The middle of the road. Why take chances when you can stay in the middle? The main characters play perfect. Yeah, what's wrong with, uh, you know, wanting to uh, live by your own values and uh, have integrity? 4D chess against the system and each other. Howard Rourke believes that charity is wasteful. Any man who works without payment is a slave. He's fighting to live for his own sake. My reward, my purpose, my life is the work itself. What a monster. My work done my way. Nothing else matters to me. In this world, each man subordinates himself to the standards of the majority, reducing their talent to make it subservient to the masses. Innovation is bad. Conformity is good. It's important to note that no real country acts like this. Really? No real country acts like this? Has Knowing Better never watched Tucker Carlson? Let's take a look at uh, Tucker Carlson. This, uh, this clip is a few years old. It's Tucker Carlson, as you can see, talking to uh, 
Big Ben Shapiro about the emerging technology of driverless vehicles. Oh. Would you, Tucker Carlson, be in favor of restrictions on the ability of trucking companies to use this sort of technology specifically to, you know, sort of artificially maintain the number of jobs that are available in the trucking industry? Are you joking? In a no. second. In a second. In other words, if I were president, what I say to DOT, Department of Transportation, we're not letting driverless trucks on the road, period. Why? Really simple. Driving for a living is the single most common job for high school educated men in this country. So we got to stall innovation to save, uh, you know, some, uh, so, some, some jobs, folks. Not to mention the all around contempt toward a uh, big tech. Woo! Meanwhile, we have goofs like Russell Brand bitching and moaning about how billionaires want to explore and colonize space. <laughs> Did a whole video on this a few months ago where I responded to a YouTube channel called Second Thought, so check that out. Has Knowing Better never heard of uh, Malala Yousafzai, who literally got shot in the face for trying to go to school because little in her society, little girls going to school was uh, not conforming to uh, some certain religious standards. But apparently no country, nobody acts like this. Nobody enforces strict conformity in architectural standards. Well, ex Oh, he just meant in architecture. My bad, you guys. Knowing better seems to be focusing way too much and too hard on the concrete rather than the principle at hand. Except for us now, apparently. The Fountainhead is Trump's favorite book, by the way. But Oh, The Fountainhead is Trump's favorite book. Is that true? Favorite book. Other than the Bible or the art of the deal. Now, she brought up the Bible and the art of the deal because uh, for anyone who has not been paying attention, there have been uh, multiple rallies of where Donald Trump uh, talks about how his two favorite books, aside from the art of the deal, which is his own book, but his favorite book is the Bible. Favorite book. Other than the Bible or the art of the deal. Um... The Fountainhead? All quiet on the Western Front. Oh, so it turns out that was a lie. But uh, why would why would Knowing Better be uh, be saying this? I get the impression that Knowing Better is trying to lump Trump in with Ayn Rand or lump Ayn Rand in with Donald Trump, trying to make Donald Trump sound like an Ayn Rand guy. This ignores the fact that Trump's business career was predicated on cronyism and political pull and second-handedness, that Trump's political career was all about nationalism and collectivism, that uh, aside from uh, everything else, nothing about Trump uh, conveys reason, rational thoughts, or self-esteem. This also does not mention that there are Democrats like Stacey Abrams who have mentioned that Atlas Shrugged is one of her favorite books. We're going to assume that Stacey Abrams is this uh, Randian hero, that her pol that her political views, that uh, Ayn Rand's political views would be reflected in a Stacey Abrams agenda. No, 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 of course not. Okay, no country takes it to the ridiculous extreme that's presented in this book, not even Soviet Russia. Though you wouldn't know that if you only ever listened to Ayn Rand. In 1947, she testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, where she accused the Christmas movie It's a Wonderful Life of being communist propaganda, since it portrays bankers in a negative light. She also describes Russians as mindless drones who would barely know what to do. Now, um, I think she used It's a Wonderful Life, and she also used other examples. I haven't visited this issue in a while. But she uh, she didn't really call them pro uh, communist propaganda, like it's coming from the Soviet Union, uh, but rather that, you know, people who are sympathetic to communism, communists in Hollywood, might uh, use rather innocent films like It's a Wonderful Life to uh, sneak in some uh, collectivistic messaging. And um, even if this was not the case with It's a Wonderful Life, it's still a uh, terrible movie that uh, preaches altruism and uh, belongs in a garbage can. To do with freedom if they had it. That's, uh, that's a great change from the Russians I have always known. I've known a lot of them. Don't they do things at all like Americans? Don't they walk across town to visit their mother-in-law or something? Look, it's very hard to explain. It's almost impossible to convey to three people. 
what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. I can tell you a lot of details. I can never completely convince you because you are free. This was exactly what Americans wanted to hear during the Red Scare. In the years after World War II, the world was consumed with the ideological battle between Western capitalism and Soviet communism. And thanks to people like Ayn Rand, our thanks to people like Ayn Rand, our understanding of Soviet Russia was cartoonishly evil. To cartoonishly evil, and what's wrong with that? He says that if this is ridiculous, even though he mentions earlier that the Bolsheviks stole her family's business and that people like Joseph Stalin gave her and many others reasons to flee the country, not to mention all of the other well-documented horrible things that happened in the Soviet Union before uh, Ayn Rand came to prominence. So if, uh, if Ayn Rand had a role in uh, informing Americans about how cartoonishly evil the Soviet Union is, then uh, I would say that that's a wonderful thing. To the point that we had to be everything they are not. If they're atheists, we're Christian. If they're collectivists... So here we go again. So he says that Ayn Rand is responsible for uh, the Red Scare and pr presumably all of the baggage that comes along with it. And there was a lot of uh, irrational tactics during the Red Scare. He's right that, uh, that American politicians tried to hold up Christianity and religion as an alternative, as a uh, response to uh, the, the alleged atheist Soviet Union. But uh, he says that Ayn Rand is responsible for this when uh, we know, and he's going to mention this later, that Ayn Rand was uh, adamant about atheism and she was harshly critical of religion. So is it fair to hold Ayn Rand responsible for some irrational behavior during the Red Scare like... Uh, trying to double down on Christianity? You know, that's a really good question. We're individualists, and if they're communists, we should be capitalists. The thing is, the Soviets were never really communists. They were working towards it, but they never- No, not real communism, you guys. Quite got there. There has never been a complete- Now, in a certain sense, he's right, because uh, Marxists, you know, after, you know, after they, uh, after the proletariat finally overthrows their capitalist overlords, the bourgeoisie, and abolishes private property, then, um, then society will just naturally transition into a stateless society. That's never going to fucking happen, folks. So, uh, yeah, it's very easy to say, oh, it wasn't real communism. ...the communist country, or a capitalist one for that matter. Since the New Deal, America has adopted... Oh, he is right, yeah. There has never been a, a truly capitalist country either. But uh, I think one can analyze countries and their governments and their political leadership and analyze the, attempt, the, the extent at, at which... They're trying to move toward free markets and whether or not they're trying to move toward socialism and state control over the uh, the means of production and uh, analyze the consequences of uh, of these actions. The liberalism with a capital L as its economic model, which is a mixed economy with regulated capitalism. This now he's right here. We, we have had a mixed economy, especially since the New Deal. This is different from being socially liberal or conservative. If communism is on the left end of the spectrum and capitalism is on the right, liberalism lands somewhere around here. I now, a proper spectrum would be authoritarianism on one end and freedom on the other. Because while communism is definitely a form of authoritarianism, authoritarianism can come in a uh, variety of forms. Ayn Rand saw this as just a step away from socialism. She wanted America to adopt the purest form of capitalism, which had been demonstrated to be the best system in... Well, there are no examples of pure capitalism. Well, and he's ignoring the fact that uh, her views of capitalism is a logical consequence of her overall philosophy. That if uh, man is a rational being, then and uh, reason is man's basic tool of survival, then man needs to be free in a social context. Man needs to be free uh, to use his mind in order to survive and pursue happiness. Which is why Ayn Rand invented one. It wasn't necessarily about, you know, uh, assessing the uh, the economic consequences like Knowing Better uh, insists here. Although when you look at, again, when you analyze the economics and the consequences of countries that try to impose socialism versus countries that try to free up their economies, the freer economies are way better, much preferable. Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957 and takes place in a future dystopian version of America, which most people just view as this America. And here's my first real problem with this book. Most dystopian novels depict a system controlled by elites that needs to be broken or at least navigated by an average person like you or me. Mod I mean, I would say that uh, in Atlas Shrugged, the uh, society is controlled by some group of elites. 
Third examples include The Hunger Games, Divergent, and even movies like Equilibrium and Snowpiercer. But even back in the day, books like Brave New World in 1984 depicted dystopias where the hero is an average person working against the system. Even Anthem and The Fountainhead follow that formula. Now, again, but uh, when it comes to elites, you know, being, you know, in the so-called elite group is not necessarily a bad thing. But in Atlas Shrugged, there are elites that are good, elites that are bad, and so on and so on. Atlas Shrugged, the average person is the bad guy. This The average person is the bad guy. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this Wikipedia page called the list of Atlas Shrug characters. The average person is the bad guy. Then how do you explain people like James Taggart, as you can see, was the president, he was a businessman, the, the president of the Taggart Tri Transcontinental Railroad. And then you also have Lillian Reardon, who was Hank Reardon. Hank Reardon's one of the good guys, but his wife, Lillian, um, you know, uh, eventually they split. She's a, you know, wealthy socialite that, that eventually turns on Hank Reardon. You also have intellectuals like Dr. Floyd Ferris and Dr. Robert Stadler. You have other uh, business executives like Oren Boyle. Meanwhile, you have uh, average Joes like Eddie Willers, who's uh, one of the good guys. Hank Reardon's secretary is also, uh, you know, a rather good person. So uh, this notion that it's all about the elites versus the average average guy and that the average guy is the bad guy and the elites are the good guys is just false. He goes on to say that he read this book uh, over like during the, uh, a few months ago, I guess. And uh, given his analysis, I have a hard time believing it. The book doesn't depict a system run by elites that needs to be dismantled. It's a system that needs to be implemented. The elite few at the top are the heroes of this story. I'm not just picking- Again, elite few at the top. How do you explain James Taggart? How do you explain Wesley Mouch? How do you explain Oren Boyle? Intellectuals like Robert Stadler, who are employed by the uh, State Science Institute which sounds like, again, going back to the beginning of this video, it sounds like uh, some bureau that you would find in uh, the Soviet Union some random work of fiction either. This is a lot of people's favorite book, especially politicians for some reason. It's regarded almost as highly as the Bible. And this isn't a- Should be regarded higher than the Bible. Thought experiment about how the world might look someday. It's a blueprint for how the world should look. These are ideas that people want to make happen. So before we get to those ideas, yes, I did. I think the book is more a warning about uh, the consequences of what happens when uh, reason and people of the mind uh, uh, vanish from society and what happens when people turn to force, turn to a uh, political pull as a solution for problems. It's 1,069 pages, nice, and took 56 hours to get through. Basically the entire month of January. I bring this up because I'm gonna have to skip over most of the plot in order to cover the main political points. I'm not gonna go into the finer details of the story, but just know that I did read it. I even watched the movies, which are universally regarded as terrible. Which brings me to my second point. The economic model suggested in this book is only possible because of the dystopian setup. A setup which is conspicuously absent from the movies. In this version of the world, humanity has suffered a severe cognitive decline. Most people are completely incapable of making any sort of independent decisions. They can't even drive through a broken stoplight. That's how bad things have gotten. The entire economy is kept going by the elite producers, the industrialists, the men of action or men of the mind. These are the only people capable of innovation and independent thought. Because of this intellectual and economic crisis, the government tries to keep things afloat through regulation and taxation, which is why the main characters refer to them as looters, in contrast to the average person, which are viewed as parasites. Since this setup is missing from the movies, the government has turned into a bunch of mustache twirling oh, villains no, who just get in the way. Ad. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that Ayn Rand believes in social Darwinism. The people at the- Social Darwinism. So we're about 10 minutes into this video. And notice that, uh, we have yet to hear anything about Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism and what objectivism is. No, 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 you guys. What Rand really advocated for was social Darwinism. Nigga, get the fuck out of here. Now, of all of the Ayn Rand books and objectivist books that I've read, and I'm just a student, I'm not an expert here, and maybe I missed something, maybe I'm misremembering, but uh, of all of the objectivist material I've read over the years, I don't seem to recall anything about social Darwinism, maybe aside from Leonard Peikoff criticizing it in his book, The Ominous Parallels, where he talks about social Darwinism and its intellectuals like Herbert Spencer, linking Herbert Spencer with Immanuel Kant, who is the antithesis 
of Ayn Rand. And from what I understand about social Darwinism, it is largely predicated on genetics and biology, whereas objectivism is predicated on reality and reason. But never mind that, folks. Pay attention to Mr. Finger Painter over here and his smears. The top are there because they deserve to be. And if you're at the bottom... Okay, if someone's at the top, they deserve to be. Again, how do you explain people like James Taggart, who is in his position because, uh, you know, he was born into the Taggart family. I also forgot to mention the Starnses. The, the Starnes heirs who uh, are responsible for destroying the 20th century motor company. I mean, these people were not average Joes. And they uh, they found they got in their position through birthright, not through achievement. But again, apparently the average Joe is the bad guy and the elites, they got there because they earned it. That's your fault. She doesn't view poor people as a class, but rather as a collection of individual failures. If only you worked hard enough, you could be a producer too. The main protagonist of the story. And I, that's not, uh, not entirely true either. I mean, Ayn Rand herself came to America with nothing and had to work her way up. Ayn Rand also welcomed in a family who were the victims of uh, FDR. The, the, the wonderful FDR and his uh, Japanese internment policy. She welcomed in some Japanese Americans into her home and uh, hired them to uh, work their way out of poverty. Is Dagny Taggart, a female railroad executive struggling to keep her trains moving against an increasingly lazy workforce and an overbearing government. Luckily, she's uniquely smart enough to predict what the looters will do and plan accordingly. She assumes that the people state of Mexico will nationalize one of her lines, so she pulls all of her best assets out of the country and intentionally lets it fall into disrepair. And she was right, they eventually do nationalize it. But think about that from Mexico's perspective. They just watched someone mismanage a railroad until it became pretty much worthless. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the No, it's not. I, I recall, if I recall correctly, Mexico also nationalized other industries in their country. And if you know that if you have business operations in another country and you know that they're about to get stolen from the government in that country, why would you continue doing work there? The other main characters is Hank Reardon, an industrialist who invents a new kind of metal that's stronger and lighter than steel. He humbly names it Reardon Metal, but it might as well be unobtainium. This new product is so threatening to the wider steel industry that the State Science Institute lies about its safety in order to preemptively ban it from coming to market. The government using science to hinder innovation. Hmm. Beca All right, let's, let's replay that. Pre pay, pay attention to the to the uh, sleight of hand here. Let's let's slow it down. Let's slow it down be unobtainium. This new product is so threatening to the wider steel industry that the State Science Institute lies about it. They lied about it. The government lied about it. Safety in order to preemptively ban it from coming to market. The government using science. So first they lie, now they're using science. Which is it? This is what we would call the law of non-contradiction. Something can't uh, both be a lie and science. If the government is uh, knowingly lying, then that's not science. To hinder innovation. Hmm. And then he acts all smug about it. Hmm. Huh. Like, that would ever happen. The government would never lie. The government would never stall innovation for uh, the sake of political pull to please uh, certain pressure groups. Because of the government ban, the Railroad Workers Union decides that it won't let any of its employees operate trains on lines made with reared in metal. Thankfully, Dagny saw through the government lines. She creates a... Sh yeah, so it wasn't science then. Shell Corporation and hires scabs to illegally build a new railroad out of unobtainium anyway, which she names the John Galt Line. And it's so successful that it threatens the wider railroad industry. So the union and the government impose unnecessary nationwide safety regulations like a speed and weight limit, which in practice only applies to the new John Galt Line. Who is John Galt is a meme which people use to explain away the unexplainable. Why are people getting dumber and lazier? Who is John Galt? Why is the government so grossly incompetent? Who is John Galt? Dagny only chose the name out of spite. She hates the phrase. Her railroad continues to suffer because of overregulation and the fact- And it's uh, it's convenient that uh, Knowing Better still has not mentioned James Taggart's role in all of this. Uh, did he read like a, a, a an edited version where all mentions of James Taggart are omitted because he's talking about uh, Dagny Taggart and the failures of her railroad, not mentioning that James Taggart had a huge role in undermining Dagny 
and uh, and and pursuing actions that destroyed the Taggart Railroad. But that might ruin his uh, his narrative that uh, that the elites were the good guys, that there were no bad elites that all of the great men of the mind have been slowly disappearing one by one. She attributes the disappearances to a man she calls the Destroyer and starts hunting for him. Narratively, the book feels a lot like Dante's Inferno. Dagny and Hank travel around and come across destitute people who have entire prepared speeches about what went wrong in their life, almost always shifting the blame for their misfortunes onto others. During one of these chance encounters, they travel to an abandoned factory and find a prototype free energy motor, which converts atmospheric static electricity into usable energy. But it's missing parts and doesn't work. Realizing what this could do for her railroad and, I suppose, the rest of the world, Dagny and Hank make it their mission to find the original inventor. And this is where that dystopian setup gets in the way. Everyone they question about the motor is dumb as rocks and can't remember anything, not even the name of their former supervisor. It's like pulling teeth to get any information out of them. But the general story is that the 20th century motor company decided to collectivize or turn themselves into a worker co-op. Everyone works according to their ability and is paid based on their need. As Again, conveniently uh, leaving out the, the heirs, the Starnes' role in this. You might have guessed the workers become lazy and start having kids or bringing an extended family just to increase their apparent need. They even he also talks about the cognitive decline as if it's ridiculous to uh, imagine a scenario where uh, where cognitive reason decline uh, results in societal collapse, like this never happened to uh, countries like Rome. And fake illnesses to receive disability payments. This led to an overall brain drain at the factory as the few men of the mind resigned in protest, one of those people being John Galt, who vowed to stop the motor of the world as he left. More captains of industry disappear, and the government begins nationalizing industries under unification boards and passing laws to prevent any single business from gaining too much power. Then they passed Directive 10289. This brings the entire economy under government control. Your job will be chosen by committee and you cannot quit. They freeze production and wages and seize all patents and trademarks. They also outlaw any new products. They don't want the economy to be at the mercy of every stray crank with a new idea. Dagny wasn't able to find the original inventor of the motor, but she hired a scientist who was in the process of reverse engineering it. Then he was visited by the destroyer and disappears. Dagny chases after him in a plane, she's also a pilot, don't worry about it, and follows him into a hidden valley in Colorado, which is protected by a Wakanda-like ray shield. She crashes, survives, and is greeted by John Galt, who is revealed to be the destroyer and the inventor of the free energy motor. She also meets all of the missing men of the mind. Turns out they all abandon their lives in the outside world to go on strike and come to this hidden valley they named Galt's Gulch to create a capitalist utopia. A completely original story that will never wait. You see, this is a world of great man economics. When the CEO of an oil or coal company disappears, nobody is able to step up and take their place. If they take their ball and go home, the game ends. Well, uh, this does happen from time to time. We saw this notably happen to Apple in the 1980s when uh, when Steve Jobs was pushed out of the company and the company as a result uh, declined until uh, Steve Jobs came back and uh, turned things around. Finding quality business leaders is uh, not easy. It's not an easy task. That's why the good ones and the successful ones get paid a lot. Most everyone else is too stupid to be able to do their job. Even their immediate subordinates have no clue what to do. The industrialists are uniquely gifted. Sometimes on their way out, they literally blow up their factories and mines so nobody else can even try to get things going. So were they fleeing the collapse or causing it? Here well, he's ignoring the justice involved with, uh, with these decisions to destroy their company. And uh, Francisco D'Anconia lays all of this out rather clearly, explaining that uh, the looters do not deserve the Dean Konya Copper Company. And if they're going to take it by force uh, and there's nothing Francisco can do about it, then he's just going to leave the company just as his uh, grandfather found it, which was nothing. Why do looters deserve the benefits of something that they, uh, that they did not produce and could never produce on their own. You know, that's a really good question. Here in Galt's Gulch, they only use gold as their currency, they all smoke cigarettes with little dollar signs on them, and they're using the free energy motor as a limitless source of electricity. Nothing created in the valley is allowed to leave. The people are allowed to leave, though. A few of them had even taken on menial day laborer jobs in the outside world to keep tabs on what's going on. Being a day laborer is the lowest, most degrading job imaginable to them. In order to pay... Well, not always. Uh, I think uh, some of the captains of industry, like Francisco, uh, it's explained that he, uh, if I recall correctly, he worked uh, day labor jobs at points of his life. Uh, Francisco worked, uh, I think, in a factory, despite having the luxury of not having to. He worked in a factory while he went to university. But yeah, in a certain context, if you're a person of great skill, intellect, and or achievement, it, it might be very degrading to consciously work below your potential. I mean, knowing better, apparent, as of today, according to his Patreon, he makes roughly $4,500 a month 
on Patreon to make YouTube videos and good for him. And I doubt that knowing better would be happier and more satisfied if he gave up his career as a YouTuber to, uh, I don't know, bag groceries for uh, $10 an hour. But this does not mean that everyone who currently bags groceries is degrading themselves. It, it depends on the context. For her care following the plane crash, Dagny becomes John Galt's house slave, which isn't much better. And then she enters into a sexual relationship with him. Here's where I need to talk about Ayn Rand's problematic depiction of women. Not just in this book, but all of her work. Marriage is completely meaningless in this world. Everyone cheats on everyone, everyone knows about it, and nobody gets in trouble. Dagny shifts her- Again, dropping a lot of context that, uh, you know, the people who are cheating are in uh, miserable relationships attraction to whoever is the most alpha male in her life at that moment. She starts with Francisco Danconia, a copper tycoon, then moves on to Hank Reardon, the steel- I think Francisco was the one who left her. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read Atlas Shrugged. ...tycoon who invents Reardon Metal, and then John Galt. All of the sex scenes are kind of rapey. We're experiencing this- And he also mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, he has a problem with the depiction of women in Ayn Rand's novels, and I don't know. I think Dagny Tag Tagger is a great character, but maybe knowing better is just intimidated by women with strong character like Dagny and Ayn Rand herself. I mean, didn't he like kind of dismiss the notion that Dagny would know how to fly a plane? What's wrong knowing better? Are you implying that women don't know how to fly planes? I'm joking, you guys. I say this because I've been told that uh, sometimes my uh, sarcasm is not uh, easy to detect story from Dagny's perspective, so we're able to hear her thoughts. Turns out she's one of those women who likes to be taken and puts on a show of not wanting it, all while secretly enjoying it. The same scenario plays out in The Fountainhead. She even fights back before giving in to his aggressively violent advances. But it's okay, she's apparently into that. Now, I don't think that reading this book will turn anyone into a rapist or inspire someone to commit a sexual assault. Well, thank you for clarifying that. But your brain is really bad at differentiating between reality and fiction. We are- Well, speak for yourself. Don't even bother trying to read Atlas Shrugged, you guys, because uh, apparently your brain is too stupid to differentiate it from reality. We are social animals, and we evolved to absorb gossip as a way to keep tabs on the community. We are rational animals capable of knowing reality, deciding between right and wrong on a proper code of ethics, grasping which information is true and not true, and then acting accordingly without having to physically see everything ourselves. Who is sleeping with who, who is lazy on the last hunt, etc. Whenever you hear one of these stories or read it in a book, your brain logs that as an example, regardless of whether or not it happened to you. That's why crime dramas are so effective. So let's say you're sitting on a jury and you hear someone say, man, I didn't assault anybody, she secretly wanted it. You see the way she was dressed? That's... That's true. Some women do be like that. No, they don't, actually. Not without telling you first, anyway. And that's really my problem with this entire book. This is fiction. None of this stuff actually happened. The people aren't this lazy and stupid and... It's just fiction, you guys. Because apparently fiction cannot reflect reality or elements of the real world in an attempt to convey a message. It's funny that uh, he writes it off as fiction, knowing that Rand, again, literally saw the Bolsheviks seize her family's business in the name of, uh, of a workers' revolution. And while it's true that uh, America is not currently the hellhole that was depicted in Atlas Shrugged, you do see a lot of people in modern America talking like the villains in Atlas Shrugged. A lot of modern day intellectuals talk like Floyd Ferris and Robert Stadler. A lot of modern day politicians talk like the politicians in Atlas Shrugged. Like the governor of New Jersey over here talking about how, uh, you know, the time for selfishness ended back in March, you guys. Now, before some of you read the entirety of this tweet and uh, get all hot and bothered in the comments to correct me, to inform me that masks uh, help reduce the spread of COVID and that some people might be carrying COVID without knowing it. And I would say if that's the case, then uh, it should not be difficult for you to appeal to my self-interest to use a mask in public during a time when testing and vaccines are not available. But you do see a lot of parallels from Atlas Shrugged in today's America. I mean, Uber and Lyft nearly shut down in California due to the AB5 law, which threatened their business model in the name of uh, helping the worker. You also have politicians saying that companies like Apple, Amazon, and Google should not have the right to operate their business and run their online stores as they see fit. We also have President Jibber Jabber and Joe Biden threatening and stalling parts of the 
fossil fuel industry without any care or concern with how many lives and jobs and opportunities are destroyed. And he does this on some vague notion of a, of a greater good. And I can go on all day with examples. I mean, did knowing better not see all of the jobs and businesses that were destroyed during COVID? A few months ago, I did a whole video about how the minimum wage debate was not about economics and how a lot of people uh, are fine if, uh, if businesses that uh, employ below the $15 an hour minimum wage, if they go under, if they go out of business, then good. Because uh, a business that cannot pay their workers a living wage should not be allowed to exist. But going back to his whole point about how it's just fiction, you guys. So uh, if you guys were ever inspired by a story of a hero overcoming difficult circumstances or were motivated uh, by a story of a hero achieving their values or if you were moved by stories that showed the consequences of evil and bad ideas, well, just forget about it because none of it is real, you guys. The government isn't this incompetent and corrupt, but people act like this is the world we currently live in. Some people are just more gifted and motivated than others, and lazy people will always find a way to mooch off of them, even using the government to make everything unfairly equal. To pull an example from the book, anti-discrimination laws are abused to force banks to give loans to poor people, because you can't discriminate against the economically disadvantaged, right? Where have I heard this before? Some government planners decided that too few people owned homes, so the planners decided to force an increase in home ownership. They lowered lending standards for people seeking a mortgage. This produced a glut of subprime loans and subprime borrowers. Is that how it happened? Yes. There are literally clips of George W. Bush bragging about his agenda to increase home ownership by using government, by using the regulatory tools at his disposal to make it easier for low income earners to purchase homes. I showed all of this in a recent video called Game Stonk, How Redditors Enriched Wall Street. But uh, what good are regulations if they're not enforced with a gun? Does knowing better honestly think that businesses can just ignore regulations and laws without consequences? The government held a gun up to the bank's heads and forced them to give loans to people who couldn't afford them? Of course not, but it sounds plausible because you read a similar story in Atlas Shrugged. What really caused the housing crash of 2008 was deregulation of the financial industry. We it was deregulation, guys. All right, let's let's uh, let's bring up our friend Don Watkins so he'll retweet this video when it goes up. This is, uh, this is In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance by Don Watkins and Yaron Brook. This particular essay was authored by Don Watkins, and as you can see, he says, did the repeal of Glass-Steagall make the banking system more fragile? When people say that Glass-Steagall was repealed, they're referring to the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999. The GLBA did not actually repeal Glass-Steagall. Instead, it repealed Section 20 and Section 32 of the Glass-Steagall Act. There was nothing banks could do after the repeal that they could not do before the repeal, save for one thing. They could be affiliated with securities firms. Under the new law, a single holding company could provide banking, securities, and insurance services, increasing competition and allowing financial institutions to diversify. And he goes on to say, uh, explain, he goes on to explain that the two major firms that failed during the crisis, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, were pure investment banks unaffiliated with depository insurance, while Merrill Lynch came close to failing, was not affiliated with commercial banks either. Glass-Steagall had stopped commercial banks from underwriting and dealing securities. It had not barred them from investing in things like mortgage-backed securities or collateralized debt obligations to the extent banks suffered losses on those instruments during the, the crisis. Glass-Steagall would not have prevented it. But also notice that knowing better does not address the points made in the PragerU video. He just says, oh, you only think that because you, uh, you read Atlas Shrugged. Which is John Galt's ideal economy. He spells it out. So yeah, the leading up to the financial crisis, the, uh, the banking and financial industry, it was John Galt's ideal with the, with the federal reserve 
Securities and Exchange Commissions, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Glass-Steagall was still largely in place, as I just explained. You also had FDIC, but uh, apparently before 2008, American banking and finance was, uh, was a John Galt paradise. Now in excruciating detail when he takes over the radio waves and delivers a 60 page monologue that in universe takes over three hours as if any of the parasites would sit through that he tells everyone what they're doing wrong that they're doomed and then he and the rest of the producers wait out the coming dark age in their hidden valley america then descends into anarchy by the end people are using wagons again the collapse of civilization isn't something to be avoided it's framed as deserved and even necessary so that the men of the minds can come back and rebuild they watch the world burn so i mean do authoritarian uh societies deserve prosperity do they deserve uh, men of the mind keeping them afloat? That they could become rulers over the ashes. The final scene is the industrialists planning out their new vision for America, even adding a new clause to the Constitution. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of production and trade. Ayn Rand believed in a separation between the state and the economy. The government just needs to get out of the way. There are only three things the government should be doing. The police to protect individual rights and property rights from within, the military to protect those rights from without, and the courts to resolve disputes. All those New Deal welfare programs need to go. In 1950s damn straight America, a lot of people agreed. She started gathering followers and formed the collective, which became somewhat of a cult. She would person- All right, so this is another common smear that uh, Ayn Rand and objectivism, it's just a cult. Cults tend uh, not to encourage people to think for themselves and act in their own self-interest, but okay, apparently it's a cult. And from what I know about this group called The Collective, uh, they were constantly disagreeing with each other and challenging each other disagree with calling it a cult, but when you look at some of the things they were required to believe, it seems pretty culty. The group included people like Alan Greenspan, Leonard Peikoff, and Nathaniel Brandon, who would go on to form various think tanks and institutes of their- Alan Greenspan eventually uh, became an economic advisor and the chair of the, chair of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, I've covered uh, Alan Greenspan in other videos. Uh, it, one video where I talk about him was in response to Robert Reich. It, it's called, uh, There's No Such Thing as the Common Good. Their own. There was actually quite a bit of drama within the group too. Ayn Rand, who was married, started having an affair with her student Nathaniel Brandon, who was also married, but she called it off and kicked him out of the group when she discovered he was sleeping with a third person, a person she viewed as inferior to herself. That's why she ended it according to her. Again, I don't know much about this, uh, this scandal, I guess you could call it, but from what I know, the main reason why she gave Nathaniel Brandon the boots was because he lied about, uh, about uh, sleeping with other women to her, not jealousy. Objectivism is the philosophy Ayn Rand and her group of loyal followers pushed with her lectures and writings in the years after Atlas Shrugged. Now we're, now we're getting to objectivism, which apparently is just a new form of uh, social Darwinism. Its basic beliefs are conveyed in John Galt's three-hour speech. But since I don't expect any of you to go read or listen to it, it's summed up by the oath the producers have to take. Yeah, guys, again, don't go read Atlas Shrugged because, again, your brain is too stupid to differentiate between reality and fiction. So just take knowing better's word for it before entering Galt's Gulch. I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine. According to objectivism, the greatest evil in the world is the philosophy of altruism. So, what is altruism? I mean, altruism is evil, but more specifically, objectivism is based on a code of ethics that says that life is the standard of value and happiness is the purpose. And reason being man's basic tool of survival, anything that negates reason or seeks to destroy life or destroy values that might help you survive flourish and pursue happiness uh that is evil and altruism is definitely a form of this that preaches sacrifice for the for the sake of others instead of your own life remember that altruism does not mean benevolence or consideration for other men altruism is a moral theory which preaches that man must sacrifice himself for others that he must place the interests of others above his own that he must live for the sake of others. I'm pretty sure it's that first one. Not everything needs to be catastrophically all or nothing. Nobody's asking you to sacrifice yourself. This is a common- No one is asking you to sacrifice yourself. Has this guy never heard of religion or Elizabeth Warren? I mean, there are entire Twitter accounts dedicated to telling Jeff Bezos to give up his money to end world hunger. Of course, when billionaires are charitable and philanthropic, you have people like Hassan Minhaj and Anand Girid Haridas and Trevor Noah and Adam from Adam Ruins Everything saying stuff like, oh, well, they're just doing it to save face. 
they're just doing it to make themselves feel better and to save on their tax bill. I mean, there is no pleasing or appeasing these brain dead cynics. In theme and objectivism, Ayn Rand regularly uses circular logic to invent private, self-reinforcing definitions of words. Let's take a look at a few examples. Which philosophy answers the question, is man free? Capitalism is the only system that answers yes. Capitalism is a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which all property is privately owned. This is a private definition of capitalism, regardless a of what- private definition of capitalism, huh? Dictionary you use, they all talk about private property. But yeah, and in this, uh, this is a speech, but it, it was an essay form in Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and Rand uh, discusses how there was never a real good definition of what capitalism is, particularly in the European countries. And she decided to expand on some of the common definitions of capitalism to uh, to make it more clear. But none of them mentioned individual rights. She added that part to make it seem like the only system to include freedom. Capitalism is the only system based on an objective theory of values. What is an objective theory of values? It's the rational conclusion one comes to after evaluating the facts of reality in relation to man. It's not subjective or intrinsic, it's objective. Which means if you don't agree with the objective reality as I see it, you're being irrational and I don't have to listen to you. I didn't. Well, reality is knowable, is it not? And if so, if there's a disagreement over facts, then someone is certainly wrong. Make that up. That's Ayn Rand's actual approach to people who disagree with her. A company. This is what I don't answer. Oh, wait That's a minute, it. you haven't heard the question yet. She's already estimated her position and my work, incidentally, displaying the quality of her brain. In his philosophy. I'll show us here. Do you want to create an incident? No. No, no. Pass it up. I don't regard this as a legitimate question. I know what kind of movement is behind that sort of junk. Well, since she isn't alive anymore, she can't. And so now uh, he may he uses these clips out of context to make Ayn Rand look like an asshole to these people asking questions when the people asking the questions were kind of bitchy about it. Over here. Over here. I want to change the topic and go back to something you said about industry. Fifteen years ago, I was impressed with your books and I sort of felt that your philosophy was proper. Fifteen years ago, I was impressed with your books. That was fifteen years ago, though. Today, however, I'm more educated. Oh, more educated. So, yeah, I was only into your books when I was less educated. What else would this imply other than uh, Ayn Rand's ideas and philosophy are for uneducated, less educated dopes? And I find that if a company... This is, is what I don't answer. Well, wait I'll a say, minute. You haven't heard the question yet. Well, She's look. already estimated her position... My, and my work, incidentally, displaying the... Yeah, what, what a bitch. Stop me from taking a look at one of her examples. It can be rationally proved that the airplane is objectively of immeasurably greater value to man, to man at his best, than the bicycle. Can it be proved that an airplane is of objectively greater value? It seems... Yes! An airplane is ob of objectively greater value than a bicycle. A bicycle cannot get you from L.A. to New York in under five hours. Not to mention the people who, uh, the Wright brothers, who uh, are known for uh, inventing the airplane, they uh, they started off operating a bicycle shop. I wonder which, uh, I wonder which uh, they think would be more valuable. Now, you can, um, you can split hairs and pick nits and say stuff like, well, if what you're looking for is, an, is a machine to exercise on or you need a... Uh, a low cost vehicle to frequently travel a couple miles here or there, in which case you're assessing the values uh, given a limited context. But it does not make the question subjective. Seems obvious until you think about it. I'm pretty sure that's subjective. The mere fact that intelligent people can disagree about this proves that it's not objective or that they're not intelligent, I guess. If the stenographer spends. What do you think has, um, has done more? What, what do you think is a greater achievement? for human progress, the bicycle or the airplane. All her money on cosmetics and has none left to pay for the use of a microscope for a visit to the doctor when she needs it. She learns a better method of budgeting her income. The free market serves as her teacher. So if you don't make the objectively correct choice according to Ayn Rand and you irrationally choose to buy lipstick instead of saving for a doctor, I guess you'll die then as you might have. 
Yeah, probably. Maybe uh, maybe you should plan ahead for uh, for, for uh, moments when you need to see a doctor when you're sick. If you happen to get sick, seeing a specialist in medicine is uh, probably more valuable than coloring your lips. I have guessed this heartless approach was somewhat of a shock to most Americans. Oh, it's heartless. In the 50s. Here in the United States, perhaps the most challenging and unusual new philosophy has been forged by a novelist, Ayn Rand. Ms. Rand's point of view is still comparatively unknown in America, but if it ever did take hold, it would revolutionize our lives. If you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will, other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. In most of her interviews at the time, her atheism takes center stage. Phil Donahue even grilled her on it in 19... 19- her atheism takes center stage. But remember, guys, Ayn Rand is responsible for some irrational behavior during the Red Scare, like politicians doubling down on Christianity to own the communists. In 80, that's how recently being an atheist was still seen as weird. But they also take issue with her views on social welfare. You don't go for altruism and charity and do good and liberal and... No, I want to help people. I want to do good for other people. What's so bad about that? Nothing. If you do it by your own choice, and if it's not your primary aim in life, and if you don't regard it as a moral virtue. Ayn Rand doesn't believe in taxation for the common good, which is a concept that she- Again, there's no such thing as the common good. She views as undefinable and will just lead to more and more theft in the name of society. Another undefinable concept to her. There is no such entity as the tribe or the public. The tribe or the public or society is only a number of individual men. Now you know where Margaret Thatcher got the idea. She views- Well, is Ayn Rand or Mar- Margaret Thatcher wrong? society and class as a group of individuals who are free to prosper or fail on their own merit. If everyone just acted selfishly, all of civilization would be improved. People should be free to profit as much. It's not so much that, you know, society would be improved by everyone acting in their self-interest. It's the fact that you as an individual have the right to act in your self-interest for your own survival and your own happiness. If you think otherwise, if you think that needs to be subordinated, if people's lives and happiness and interests need to be subordinated to the group, then you're starting on a road toward dictatorship. As they can, doing whatever it is they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with the rights of others. All economic transactions should be voluntary, which means the right to disagree or refuse is key to her philosophy. If you're forced to work for someone, that's basically slavery. Part of me wants to agree with this, but it kind of assumes that everyone has good intentions. We know where the right to refuse lives. He says, uh, you know, if you're forced to work for someone, it's essentially... He says this as if it's controversial. He also mentioned the whole thing about, oh, you have a right to do with uh, whatever you want without violating the rights of others. It does not always mean that it's good to just do whatever you want. You're free to start your day by eating a big bowl of mayonnaise for breakfast and washing it down with a fifth of tequila, but it's... Uh, it's probably a bad idea. But again, objectivism is not just all about politics. You do need a proper code of ethics so that you do know how to uh, act rationally in a free society. Leads us. People won't grant marriage certificates or bake wedding cakes for gay couples. They won't offer birth control in their health insurance. And if the majority of Americans still had their way and still had the right to refuse, segregation would still be a thing. Sometimes the invisible hand must be forced because some of you are still stuck in the past. So here's another smear trying to lump Rand in with the racist because she, uh... Ayn Rand viewed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as a violation of property rights. You can't force businesses to serve black people, in case you were wondering why so many white people were drawn to this message. As so there you go. Uh, trying to lump Rand in with the racists because she disagreed with parts of the Civil Rights Act, and he says that, you know, sometimes the invisible hand needs to be forced. Otherwise, we just, uh, we'd still have segregation without the Civil Rights Act. This, uh, this of course, ignores the fact that the Civil Rights Act uh, mostly addresses government, discrimination in, and segregation in government, and public institutions. And this was because segregation was largely imposed by government and economic regulations. Remember those uh, beloved New Deal programs under FDR that Knowing Better was praising earlier? Well, a lot of those New Deal programs helped reinforce segregation and discrimination against black Americans because in order to get those New Deal programs through, 
FDR needed to compromise with segregationist Democrats. For more on this, check out my video called White Supremacy is Embedded in Capitalism, which I published a few months ago. But it's also worth noting that Rand stresses that politics is the final stage. And in order to have capitalism, in order to have a free society, you first need to prepare the culture with better ideas like objectivism. Objectivism rejects racism because it is an individualist philosophy that sees racism as the lowest form of collectivism. So in a free market where objectivism is the dominant school of thought, racism would not exist or at the very least would be very rare and uncommon and scrutinized. As a result, her cold, selfish philosophy of objectivism didn't really catch on in mainstream American politics. Neither party was willing to adopt its ideas. All that changed in 1971 when a group of free thinkers voluntarily associated with each other and created the Libertarian Party. The first election they took part in was 1972. Ayn Rand never liked libertarians, dismissing them as right-wing hippies. All kinds of people today call themselves libertarians, especially something calling itself the New Right, which consists of hippies who are anarchists instead of leftist collectivists, but anarchists are collectivists. Capitalism is the one system that requires absolute objective law, yet libertarians combine capitalism and anarchism. That's worse than anything the new left has proposed. It's a mockery of philosophy and ideology. This is despite their obvious similarities with Rand. Libertarians tend to be atheists and believe in individual liberty, which means they were pro-choice and for the decriminalization of drugs, both of which were very unpopular opinions at the time. So he cites Rand trashing the libertarian movement due to fundamental differences and genius boy over here lists off some superficial similarities to say, oh, well, they're essentially the same. Pushing grandma off of a cliff versus pushing grandma out of the way of a moving bus. Well, they're essentially the same action because at the end of the day, you're just pushing grandma, right? Absolutely fucking not. And I think this is a good place to end. The rest of this video is an analysis of American politics through the 70s and 80s without really connecting it to Ayn Rand or objectivism, but uh, I want to go back to what Knowing Better said at the beginning of the video. I've been an adult for a while now, and in recent years, I find myself wondering why things are the way they are. And more specifically, were they always like this? You see, I'm a voter, and as any voter can tell you, politics are complicated. So complicated that most people don't even bother. I certainly haven't been immune to that fact. It's only in recent years that I've made an effort to understand certain policies and programs, which is way more difficult than you might think. And I'm forced to ask, why? The older generation of voters who have passed on their knowledge say that it's always been- As Rand said in her book, Philosophy Who Needs It, a political battle is merely a skirmish with muskets. A philosophical battle, well, that's nuclear war. If you want to understand the states of American politics, you first need to look at the dominant philosophical trends. And if you want to change politics for the better, you ultimately have to offer better ideas than the ones that are motivating the culture to choose corrupt political leaders. And while there is still some respect for reason, individualism, self-interest, and capitalism in America today, it certainly does not manifest itself politically when socialism, cynicism, and critical race theory are becoming increasingly popular amongst the so-called left and the Democratic Party as Republicans and the so-called right embrace nationalism, religion, and conspiracy quackery as an alternative. This does not mention the fact that the last Republican president before Trump George W. Bush was a religious person himself and was happy to intervene in the economy with his compassionate brand of conservatism. Anyway, some of you out there may have been deceived or disappointed by Knowing Better's piss poor analysis of Ayn Rand and her connection to American politics, but hopefully after watching this video, you know better. <laughs>